Um, Francesco Fanella, curator of the Magnus Collection, Jewish Shot in Life. About two years ago, thanks to a very important gift to the University of California, the Magnus was able to acquire the Archership Collection. It was a privately owned collection, and now it's being cataloged and made available to, to the general public. As we're doing this work of cataloging it, we're also convening a variety of colleagues from campus and, 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 and the area to help us think through the implications. So you're kind of surrounded by examples of the authorship collection. It's on the walls of the auditorium, so I hope you will take time after the talk too. And authorship was a miniaturist, so a lot of what you see on the walls uh, of, of the auditorium are actually enlarged digital versions of, of this art, and there's more art, actual original art on display in the in the gallery as you walk in through the through the building. So you get to see some of that. And uh, so we're we're sort of investigating a variety of dimensions around the work of Arthur Schick, who lived at the same time in different countries and in different uh, sort of spaces, aesthetics, uh, cultural, political worlds. And uh, I'm very pleased that our colleague John Connolly from uh, the Department of History here at UC Berkeley accepted the invitation to come and talk about one aspect of Arthur Schick's life production that has been somewhat uh, not fully studied. I think there are a variety of reasons for that, in, in part also the sources and language and so on. But it, John Connolly is here to help us think about the worlds of Arthur Schick, specifically in, in the situation of Jews in Poland in the interwar period. Uh, it's, a, it's a pivotal time for, for all of us who are thinking about this, uh, this important collection uh, to, to study, to learn about, and it's with great pleasure that I'm welcoming John to, to the podium. Uh, John Connolly is Professor of History here at the University of California, Berkeley, and current director of the Institute of East European, Eurasian, and Slavic Studies. Uh, we, I'm not going to read all of these many publications, but they're all there. I promise, <laughs> and, uh, but actually he's working uh, currently on a history of East Central Europe, 1784 to the present, due to appear with Princeton University Press. Please help me in welcoming John Connery. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. We'll have time after the talk for questions and answers. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, thank you so much, um, Francesco, for the kind invitation to speak tonight. Uh, about Poland, which is a country dear to my heart. I was a student there for three years uh, in the 1980s um, and 1990s. I did research there. Uh, but as Francesco uh, noted, I've just finished a large book on East European history, so I've felt somewhat distant from Poland. I've been seeing Poland more in terms of its relations to its neighbors in the last couple of years. So what I say will take a bit of a bird's eye view about Poland. Um, so I, I, I'm not speaking as from the perspective of somebody who really thinks deeply about Poland as, 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 as Poland, but more about Poland as a European society uh, in the troubling century that we've just left behind us, uh, namely the 20th century that historians are investigating. So my, my talk tonight, uh, I was invited to speak about the Polish state that existed in the years between the two world wars. Um, that's the state you, you see there on the map. These are borders that were more or less stable for a brief period, only 18 years. It's the Polish Second Republic uh, from 1921 to 1939. I'm going to be, here's Poland in its European configuration, a completely new state with other completely new states in 1918, 1919. Here's uh, the major figure I'll be talking about tonight, Józef Piłsudski, originally a socialist, but the major force in Polish politics in the early 20th century. Uh, here's another politician I won't say much about, but the largest in some ways political movement in Poland was the peasant movement here. It's one of its major, major um, leaders, Vincente Vitos. This man is Pilsudski's successor, uh, Edward Smigli Ridge, as you can see, is, he's a military man. And then finally, I'll be saying a bit about this man as well, not in a uniform, although he ought to be. He's the head of the National Democrats, uh, Roman Domowski. Um, now from certain perspective, you might say this is a pretty boring cast of characters and a pretty predictable topic from which little can be learned that is edifying from a certain perspective. Eastern Europe, in fact, East, Europe east of the Rhine River was a disaster zone for democracy 
after World War I. Uh, just to rehearse some of what happened, generally speaking, I'll give you the map again. Benito Mussolini staged his march on Rome in 1922, gradually ushering in the end of Italian democracy. Then democracy failed in Albania in 1925, Lithuania in 1926, Yugoslavia in 1929, the well-known cases of Germany and Austria in 1933. Then in 1934, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, all abandoned democratic Republican forms of government. Greece in 1935, and finally before World War II, sort of just, just getting in under the wire in a sense, is Romania, 1938. Hungary had been a sham democracy since 1921. So Poland is one of the mix of these countries. Uh, in three days in May of 1926, Marshal Piłsudski seized power in a violent coup d'etat against a legal government. And this coup d'etat, this seizure of power by Marshal Piłsudski had 379 casualties, both civilian and, and military, mostly in Warsaw. So after that point, Paul, uh, Piłsudski became what you might call from a certain distance Poland's strongman, its military leader. Um, that would seem to be the end of the story. In Poland, we had the nationalist Piłsudski in military uniform as the local potentate, whereas elsewhere we had other uniformed figures in charge like Hitler and Mussolini, or less known figures like King Karol, of Romania, King Boris of Bulgaria, or Admiral Horty of Hungary, uh, having a laugh with a friend of his uh, <laughs> on the right, uh, who needs no introduction or mention. Um, but what I'm going to suggest to you actually is that the truth is quite the opposite. Um, and here I'm going to echo well-known phrase of Tolstoy. Um, slight variation on his original statement. One might say that all democracies are the same but each authoritarian state is authoritarian in its own way. Um, that is, democracies fulfill certain basic conditions, rule of law, and democratic institutions, perhaps income equality and things like that, whereas the non-democratic regimes, all of which I've just mentioned, represent a wide variety of types. And for that reason, it's, it's some, in, some, in some sense worth looking at each very closely, and I think Poland is a special case of that uh, kind of regime from that distant time, about 80 to 90 years ago, that I'll be talking about tonight. In other words, I'm going to say that beneath and behind the authoritarian facade of Piłsudski's author authoritarian regime, Poland, of the years between the world wars, so from about 1918 to 1939, featured a tremendous mix of cultural and social energies, world-class scholarship, influential and fascinating arts, great music, uh, really avant-garde musicians of all kinds, uh, a vast range of interesting political movements, some noxious, some, some, some actually uh, stimulating and edifying, uh, from the left to the right. So I want to capture a bit of that Poland tonight. I won't be able to touch upon many of the things I've just mentioned. I won't talk about literature or art. What I'll do is I'll focus on what I know best and what I usually tend to read about and write about, which is politics, society, institutions of state, uh, and in particular, uh, how these institutions of state of the interwar years related to Poland's many ethnicities, including the Jews. As I suggested with the reference to Tolstoy, each of the failure stories of the states of interwar Central and Eastern Europe varied. And it's, it's surprising if you look at them as, as, as a group. So some of these failed democracies were losers of the war, Germany and Hungary. And so, in fact, one historian has even said that the war never ended and that um, the loss of war somehow doomed democracy. But we also see that some of the failed democracies uh, were among the winners of the war. Italy and Romania technically were on the winning side of World War I, yet in both of these states, democracy was troubled and collapsed. Some of these states were multi-ethnic, like Romania and Yugoslavia, and I'll talk about multi-ethnicity in Poland in a moment, but, if, but some of them were relatively mono-ethnic, Hungary and Austria, for example. Some of these states had deep histories of statehood. Some of them were brand new, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, for example. Some were relatively wealthy, like Germany, yet most were overwhelmingly agricultural and peripheral to the central capitalist economies, like Bulgaria or Romania. The interesting thing, um, and this is gonna be a statement about the region as a whole from the standpoint of a century, uh, a century of development, is that when these republics and democracies were created right after World War I, no one believed that any of them would fail. The peacemakers in Paris created most of, the, most of these states. 
is exactly 100 years ago. Um, exactly 100 years ago, Woodrow Wilson was in Paris. There was actually a, a, a professor named Robert J. Kerner, who was one of my predecessors, who was also in Paris, uh, a professor at Cal from 1928 to 1956, was among the experts called to Paris to create the new post-war order. None of these experts thought that the democracies they were creating could fail. They believed that if you gave a country a constitution, like if you give Romania or Yugoslavia a constitution on the Western model, and you threw in political parties, uh, rule of law, democracy would grow almost on its own. It was, so to speak, the default position of humanity to be democratic. Now, I would say there's no ex excuse for that way of thinking, but back then the world knew no history of a country attempting democratic rule and coming up short. In other words, there was no history of failed democratization, of the United States promoting democr democratic institutions in some foreign country um, and that not working out. This is, by the way, what the U.S. did in 1919. The Polish map that I showed you a moment ago would not have existed in the form that it was if not for a gentleman elected um, to the presidency of the U.S. in 1916, Woodrow Wilson. It was partly his idea and partly his creation. And if some of you are American citizens, in some ways it's our own legacy, what I'm talking about tonight. Poland, the Poland that I'm talking about um, was, in some sense, an American creation. Poland in 1919 seemed to have a number of things really going for it, however, as a democracy. It had a very old, this is not well known, so let me just dwell a little bit about the deeper history. It had a very old democratic heritage, contrary to what people think these days actually about Poland. Poland actually is a very old democracy. The democracy was not a broad democracy in the early modern period. It was vested in the traditional ruling group known as the gentry or in Polish the szlachta. Here is what some of them looked at, like when they dressed up. Um, this gentry was remarkable on the European background because it was very large and historically had a tradition of governing its own affairs. My daughter is trying to reach me. Sorry, this is probably the first case you've ever had of somebody's cell phone going off who's the speaker. Um, this gentry, uh, unlike other European nobilities or gentries, was very large and historically had governed its own affairs through representative institutions going back many centuries. Uh, the parliaments, uh, local parliaments, but also central parliaments in Poland went back to the Middle Ages and from the 16th century, Poland's gentry, which was about a quarter of the population in central Poland, actually elected their own kings. Um, the crucial point uh, is that this very large gentry had a lot of heirs. So a lot of people were descended from this gentry in 1919 Poland, and in some senses shared this basic ethos that people should rule themselves. Uh, the Polish for this is nic o nas bez nas, nothing about us without us, right? So there was, in some sense, a deep, uh, at a cultural level, there was, there was a deep history of political culture that was democratic in Poland. Uh, now you all know that Poland, early modern and, and, and medieval Poland disappeared from the map of Europe in 1795 when its three neighbors subdued the Polish state uh, in a series of partitions. And here's a map of the gradual kind of shrinking of Poland until there was nothing left uh, between 1772 uh, and, and 1795. Um, yet before this happened, before this erasing of Poland from the map in 1795, there had been a reforming Polish parliament that passed, this is a little known fact, the second constitution in the world, May 3rd, 1791, after the United States, um, which, if it had not been for the destruction of Poland by its neighbors, by Russia, Prussia, and Austria, would have transformed Poland, making it a place with free, if limited, elections, separation of powers, and civil liberties. From an international perspective, that was the real loss of 1795 when Poland disappeared from the map. Poland would have become the world's second constitutional democracy. That's what it was set to become uh, before its neighbors moved in and destroyed that reform. Furthermore, uh, moving a bit for, further forward in history, in the decades right before World War I, in two of, the, two of the partition areas that held by Austria in the south, sometimes called Galicia, and that held by Germany in the west around Poznan, these had been places with constitutional government featuring elections, representative bodies, so that in 1919, Poland possessed a full range of political parties with people used to self-rule in these two areas, uh, to a lesser extent also in the Russian area. Poland in 1919 had an administrative corps, an army, 
and social and cultural elites who, generally speaking, simply transferred their allegiance from the three partitioning powers, Austria, Germany, and Russia, to the new Polish state. That is, Poland had a vibrant and developed civil society. And this placed it in distinct contrast to other places where democratization has been attempted in more recent times. For example, the states that experienced the so-called Arab Spring, or post-Soviet Russia, Uzbekistan, or Belarus. These are places that had very weak civil society. Poland in 1921 was very different. Furthermore, Poland after 1921 had a fully democratic constitution. Um, so it had a lot going for it. If I were to dwell upon the factors in general, and I'll talk more about the specific history in a moment, that caused this experiment in democracy to, democracy to fail, I would mention above all, above all else, the complexity of the new state. And I had this map up earlier. Um, this complexity had to do with a couple of facts, and the colors give away the basic story at the beginning. Um, namely, in the time that Poland had not existed as a state, so that's from 1795 to 1918, a number of other groups had attained national consciousness. It was already in 1795 a very, um, we would now say multi-ethnic, a very culturally complex territory. But what happened in the 19th century is that a number of groups in that territory grew to believe that they too were nations and deserved their own states. The largest such group were the Ukrainians. There were about five million Ukrainians in interwar Poland. But there were also, and you can see this on the map, so the Ukrainians, by the way, are in yellow on the map, in case you can't read the fine print. Uh, in green are uh, Belarusians, and further north, um, smaller groups in orange of Lithuanians in the west. You can see Germans. Uh, Pol uh, Jews, Polish Jews, were spread throughout the map. You don't see them because they tended to be interspersed with the other populations, mostly in cities and towns. There were about three and a half million uh, Jews in interwar Poland. Uh, Poland's Jews, like the other groups, mostly transferred their loyalty from the old states, Austria, Germany, Russia, to the new Polish state. But among Jews, among some Jews too, th there were strong sentiments that Jews were a nation that should have at least some kind of self-rule some kind of autonomy. So, in the new Polish parliament, the same, one third of the deputies represented groups that in some ways objected to the basic assumption behind Poland's constitution, given in the preamble, namely that Poland was a state of the Polish nation. Here it says, we, the Polish nation, grateful to Providence for setting us free, uh, et cetera, et cetera, remembering gratefully the courage and perseverance of the self-sacrificing struggle, do enact and establish the same of the Republic of Poland. It's the Polish nation doing this. And the Polish word naród is an ethnic understanding of nation equivalent to the German folk. And that was a problematic statement in that period for those other groups. Uh, the other groups would have liked Ukrainians, Jews, Belarusians, Germans, would have liked Poland to be a federal state with some local autonomy in the regions of Poland rather than what it became, which was a centralized state, ruled from Warsaw almost entirely by Poles, ethnic Poles, for the sake of Poland, for the sake of the Polish state. There were very few Jews or members of other minorities in the state apparatus. Uh, so an additional aspect of the complexity of this state was it's evident from this map where there, when there was no Poland just before World War I, is that the political landscape had been divided in three. So with, there were three fully developed political spectrums in these three areas of Poland in the three uh, uh, partition, partition areas. In some cases, these parties joined together quite quickly, like the Social Democrats, Pilsudski's party, or the National Dem Democrats. They came together from all three zones. But in one major case, uh, the peasant movement, the peasant movement in the Russian s side and the Austrian side did not come together. Uh, the Austrian's uh, peasant movement was less radical than the Russian-Polish peasant movement, meaning that the peasant movement was split, and most Polish peasants, the overwhelming majority of society, was not well represented. Beyond this uh, issue of complexity, there's another thing I want to point to as a problem for interwar Polish democracy, and that is a division that is difficult to understand, and I've been studying this for a while, and I can't claim to comprehend it myself. It's a division in Polish nationalism between the center left and the center right. It's a division that emerged in the 1880s. This was a time across European politics when democratic and liberal parties were fragmenting in Germany and Austria, for example. 
Usually these liberal, earlier liberal parties from the mid-century then broke up. They broke up usually into nationalist, socialist, peasant, Christian, and then other parties. Sometimes among Jews, a Zionist party, uh, for example, emerged. Therefore, uh, if we turn to the major, the most famous Polish nationalist, Józef Piłsudski, interestingly enough, uh, Piłsudski became a political figure, became active in politics. Um, he was, in fact, the most important Polish polit politician of the 20th century. But when he came to politics as a young man in the 1880s and 1890s, he was a socialist uh, who then later gradually evolved toward nationalist positions. He originally was a member of the, of the Schlachta, of the gentry, so were his comp competitors, by the way. Not from a rich family, um, but it was a family that was deeply patriotic. He was reared in the tradition of the Polish uprisings of the 19th century. Two failed uprisings, but these were in some ways imbued by a romantic spirit, uh, according to which Poles were rising up not just for Polish independence, but for independence of all human beings. A major slogan goes back to the 1831 uprising for your freedom and our freedom in the name of God. Um, the Poles who rose up believed they were doing it for a broad hum human uh, cause. This was the spirit he grew up in, uh, but he came from an unusual background on the background of all of Poland. He came from the Far East. He came from Lithuania, and he converted to, he's brought up in a Catholic family, not a, I think a very observant Catholic family, but he became Protestant for the sake of marriage later in life. So the major Polish national figure of the early 20th century was Protestant, became Protestant. Um, and he was, he thought of himself in some sense, as, in an important sense, as also Lithuanian. All right, so he's a complex and interesting figure. And he believed that Poland, as it emerged, should embody these, these, these complex traditions of the old Polish multicultural, multi-ethnic commonwealth that was destroyed in 1795. As a socialist, and by the way, he was very well versed in Marx, Marx, Marxism. This is a little known fact. He read Marx in Russian prison, by, by the way. He had a lot of time to, to contemplate uh, uh, phil philosophy in, in, in Russian prisons in, in the 1890s. But as a socialist who wanted revolution for workers, he gradually became convinced that what Polish workers needed to be free, what all humans needed to be free, was their own national state. Uh, but he did, he, when he became more of a nationalist than a socialist, he remained a revolutionary. He insisted upon active, violent work to undo Poland's oppression. He said that Poles in the three partitioning areas were living lives of slavery, and the only response was terror. He began uh, to school fighting units um, in the early 20th century in, in, in the Austrian city of Krakow. Uh, and because the number of his followers so, was so great, he actually organized fighting units on Russian territory as well. Using bombs and pistols, his fighting group staged hundreds of attacks. On one single day, to give you an example, August 15, 1906, they killed 80 Tsarist officials and Polish collaborators. In 1908, Pilsudski and a unit of 15 men, here's what he looked like, by the way. He looks a little bit like a, what shall we say, a Wild West figure almost. That's, in some sense, is what he was. Um, 1908, he and a unit of uh, 15 men and four women, including his future wife, Alexandra, carried out an attack on a Russian mail train near Vilno, seizing a small fortune of 200,000 rubles, which they then uh, plied, uh, plowed back into the organization to purchase weapons and support further paramilitary training. During World War I, he organized legions against Russia under Austrian rule but because he refused to have his men swear loyalty to Germany, he was arrested in 1916. Um, in 1918, in November, when he emerged from prison, he was recognized in Warsaw by all sides as the leader who might be able to forge the various military formations on Polish territory into a coherent fighting force that would reestablish Polish statehood. That was his highest goal. And that's exactly what he did. From 1918 to 1921, Poland, in some senses, was involved in constant fighting mostly in the east, but also in the west and on the south. Pilsudski was the supreme commander, um, uh, but he didn't do it all by himself. Uh, well, here, by the way, is his co-conspirator in terrorist activities. Oh, and I, I found a book uh, with interesting title, Terrorista, recent book about Pilsudski, showing that Poles themselves are aware of this and don't find it to be unusual. Uh, but here are some people, some women, who 
took uniforms and helped create independent Poland in 1919 in Lviv. Um, the point of showing you these pictures is to show you how widely supported this agenda of creating, recreating Polish statehood was. These are more women fighters in Lviv in 1919. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, a problematic aspect of his nationalism from the perspective of the right. Because he was a socialist and an advocate of the old commonwealth, he had a program of cooperating with other ethnicities. He even had the idea of making Poland part of a huge federation uh, after World War I that would extend from the Baltic Sea down to the Black Seas and the Adriatic Sea. It was called Intermarium. Poland would be united with all those other states and they would have the ability to throw off any challenges coming from a powerful Germany or a powerful Russia. Um, now, because of his commitment to interethnic cooperation, uh, precisely because he wanted to unite with other powers on an almost equal basis, Poland was seen as an unforgivable f uh, enemy on the right. From the 1890s, a second movement had grown called National Democracy, or in Polish, Endetsia, based in the lower gentry and urban middle classes, uh, unlike the working class that supported Piłsudski originally. Um, these National Democrats, or Endex, wanted a Polish Poland and condemned as absurd the romantic idea uh, that Piłsudski was raised in according to which to fight for Poland was to fight for the freedom of people everywhere. The only proper function of Polish politics in the view of National Democrats, or Endex, was to make Poland strong of and for itself. Their leader, whose portrait I've shown you, Roman Domowski, was himself a scientist, a natural scientist, uh, I believe a biologist. He came from a humble background, also of gentry background, but from Western Poland. He understood the nation as a quasi-biological, living, social organism, so that any talk of compassion for other nations was pointless, indeed, in his view, immoral. Poland's destiny, its only destiny, was to fight other ethnicities in a zero-sum contest, in a history without meaning, because human history, in his view, was natural history. Any belief in progress lacked scientific foundation, and the National Democrats assumed the grim but necessary task of disciplining the Polish organism, that's how they thought of the nation, of uniting it and coordinating its thoughts, desires, and feelings. Domowski's National Democratic Party portrayed the state's task after 1919 as one of strengthening a purely ethnic Poland, and that meant, if possible, forcibly Polonizing Ukrainians and Belarusians. Uh, and reducing as far as possible the numbers of Germans and Jews because he, view, he, he viewed them as unassimilable. Uh, in the years between the, I think it was in the 1920s, he said that Jews are 10% of our population. In my judgment, that is 8% too many. He thought at most there could be 2% Jews on Polish territory. Um, he said, unless restrictions are imposed upon them soon, he was not in government, all our lawyers, doctors, and small merchants will be Jews. He thought that was unacceptable. Like many liberals and former liberals, Domowski was anti-clerical, so he was against the Catholic Church originally, and claimed national egotism was morally superior to Christian teaching because the command to love one's neighbor was actually rooted in a fear of revenge. Individual human beings owed everything to the nation in his view, and therefore the nation's interests had to stand above every other commitment. Looking on the background of Europe at that time, national democracy and Detsia focused national egotism more strongly than other new right parties I can think of, even the Action Francaise in France, which was not as uncompromising in its chauvinism because it did not match an unremittingly gloomy view of history with fear of a nation's extinction. So Domowski and Pilsudski both came of age before World War I, and Domowski was particularly pessimistic about the chances of Poland ever being reborn. Uh, so there's a deep pessimism in national democracy. Um, so the two major strands of Polish nationalism, Pilsudski's determined but fierce, but arguably tolerant one, and Domowski's equally determined and fierce, yet chauvinist and anti-Semitic one, undergirded the views, undergu undergirded views of the world that could hardly have been more different. These two completely hostile groups considered each other as traitors, especially the right to the left. Uh, the last conversation between Domowski and Pilsudski took place in 1920. Um, so you have the two most important figures in Polish statehood not even talking to each other. So when the new state was formed, it faced not only the extreme difficulty of getting any government to form and function amidst the tremendous ethnic and regional complexity I've shown you, with one third of the delegates, minority delegates, but the fact that each of the, of, of the two major po Polish parties wished the other did not even exist. 
This on the background of the region was not necessary. As evidence, we can look to Czechoslovakia where there were five Czech parties uh, from National Democrats to Social Democrats in the Czech lands that cooperated with each, with each other throughout the interwar years and gave Czechoslovakia a certain kind of political coherence. If Poland's Social Democrats and National Democrats had been willing to cooperate in some pragmatic issues with give and take, uh, there could have been a stable Polish government in the 1920s. Instead, Poland, by 1926, had 14 different governments. There was no stability, there was constant crisis um, until May of that year, 1926, when Pilsudski finally lost patience and moved with his coup d'etat. At that point, the Polish currency, the Zloty, it was very with great difficulty stabilized in 1924, it had just collapsed again under German pressures. Uh, and Piłsudski feared the collapse of Polish statehood. He feared also that the National Democrats would seize power if he didn't seize power. Um, and in fact, we know in the meantime that Demowski had gone to a mission throughout Europe, Western Europe in early 1926, trying to get support for the idea that he would become Poland's dictator and stage a national revolution. To stop that from happening, Pol Pilsudski staged his seizure of power. Three days of May 1926. Here he is uh, in a famous photo marching across a bridge to meet with the president of Poland. Um, he expected that the president of Poland would give up without a fight. Uh, the president did not give up without a fight, and therefore there was three days of, of, of bloodshed between various units of the army, some loyal to him, some loyal to the government. In the end, it was the socialist railroad, railroad workers who decided the contest by failing to, to deliver army reinforcements to the capital. And so the president, his name was Wojciechowski, resigned. When Piłsudski took over, he vowed to respect the Constitution. He said he actually um, had moved in favor of democracy, that he himself was a Democrat. He said his goal was not dictatorship. He claimed that a mass popular movement had brought him to power and compelled him to stage what he called a march on Warsaw against what he portrayed as the corruption, bribery, and misuse of state funds by the right-wing government that he toppled. Um, so what Piłsudski did, and this is again interesting on the background of all of Europe, is that he used violence to keep a right-wing alternative from emerging and establishing itself. Um, he, in other words, this military strongman, I think he's the only military strongman in Europe who used military might to frustrate the ambitions of radical nationalists and fascists. So Poland went a slightly different way in, its, 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 um, in this end of its democratic experience. Piłsudski uh, called his regime Sanacja, S-A-N-A-C-J-A, Sanacja, meaning sanitation, cleaning up. He wanted to clean up the mess left by parliament. He assembled a team of experts ruling with temporary success until about 1930 because of a long strike in England that provided markets for Poland's major export good, which was coal. So the Polish economy did pretty well until 1930, until the Depression. After that, it rapidly declined uh, so that unemployment in the cities reached quarter to a third of the population, of the working population. Uh, on this background, a political opposition emerged against Pilsudski on the right. I'm sorry on the left, on the left, among his, his former comrades. Here's this, this is Krakow in 1930. It called itself Centro Lev or Center Left. So this is an interesting photograph, I think, because it shows you that despite Pilsudski's authoritarian rule and his dictatorship, as it's known, these thousands of people had no hesitation to appear for an opposition rally in Krakow, uh, demanding that there be a new government and that Pilsudski step aside and make way for a better government that could deal with the problem. His response, however, was not to be a Democrat, but to arrest some five dozen leaders of the left parties, of the peasant left party and the social de his own social democratic party, and, and place them in a great eastern fortress at Brest, or Brzesz in Polish, just before the elections would take place in 1930. Here, these prisoners were beaten, given starvation rations, and forced to do humiliating tasks. These were, in many cases, old, very distinguished men they were forced to clean the toilets, the latrines of this, of this fortress uh, prison. Eleven of these men were convicted of planning a coup to remove the government by force on trumped up charges, by the way. 
and five, including the prominent peasant politician Vitos, whose picture I showed you at the beginning, chose to leave Poland altogether. In 1934, Piłsudski set up a detention camp, um, sometimes called a concentration camp, at a place called Bereza Kartuszka, and had other op opponents sent there, usually younger opponents, without any trial, uh, with the goal of breaking them psychologically. Many of these, in fact, most of them were communists, but there were also some young fascists among these people arrested by Pilsudski from the tiny Falanga movement, as well as Ukrainian and Belarusian nationalists. His Sanatsi regime also launched a campaign against the Slavic minorities, against the Belarusians and Ukrainians, using army units to ransack Ukrainian villages, to destroy Ukrainian cultural infrastructure like reading rooms and schools, as well as Ukrainian Uniate and Orthodox churches. Ukrainians responded by carrying out a number of highly visible assassinations against Polish officials. So this is a sad time, uh, early 1930s in Poland. Um, despite his one-time dreams for this federation that I showed you going between these seas, Pilsudski, in fact, as commander, he was actually called the commander of Poland in the end, did very little to ameliorate Poland's nationality problems. In the meantime, the Polish economy failed to recover in the early 1930s. Uh, Piłsudski became increasingly a recluse. We are told that he was visited by terrible dreams of what would ensue in Poland after he died, that he sought to contact spirits and the like. Finally, he did succumb to cancer in 1935. But when this happened, he was mourned by hundreds of thousands uh, across all political camps and, of course, with the Catholic Church prominent um, he was mourned also by many Polish Jews who had seen him as a protector. So now commences a truly dark time in politics, the late 1930s. His successors, mostly military men of a far lower caliber than he was, um, even more than he, lacked clear orientation. And they took repressive measures that had begun under his rule to a higher level. The only positive thing that I could say in the European background about Poland in the late 1930s is that like, unlike in other places, especially Romania and Hungary, Poland did not produce a strong fascist movement. Pilsudski had arrested fascists at this one concentration camp and put them behind bars, put them out of circulation, and that policy continued. Um, but the fact was that fascism remained a very tiny movement in Poland. There weren't that many fascists to arrest. Uh, usually, these fascists were at universities, uh, young people. Um, historians have given differing explanations as to why fascism failed to succeed or to grow in Poland. One is that many Poles abhorred totalitarian regimes, saying that, like the one in Germany, saying that it was out of touch with Polish traditions, Polish democratic traditions. Um, the ones I mentioned above, nothing with, about us without us. And there was a certain way in which it seemed um, un-Polish to put on a black shirt and goose step in Warsaw. You seem to be imitating not a Polish nationalist, but the Polish nationalist enemy, the Nazis, right? So that was one reason why fascism didn't grow. But it's also true that people in Poland attracted to one of the major planks of fascism, namely racism, didn't need to become fascist. Racism and anti-Semitism already had a very comfortable home in this old established party of national democracy. And in 1926, National Democrats created their own sort of mass organization on fascist models called the Great Poland Camp. Um, and they tried to train fighting units directly ins inspired by fascist models. Um, Sanatia closed this down, but then it changed into a new form in the early 1930s. From the mid-1930s, explicit racism entered NDEC thought, that is National Democratic thought, especially in its youth section, where there were individuals who thought of themselves as fascists. Uh, and this, these racists rejected all talk of assimilation of Jews, even via baptism into the Catholic Church. They demanded laws to eliminate Jews' rights. Uh, but like everyone in the grips of theories about biological destiny, they despaired. In their eyes, Jews were indestructible, and even severe repression would not weaken them. That's why they wanted a revolution. Within Pilsudski's camp, the Sanatia camp, the, after his death, the right and left wings converged in their programs, going from anti-Bolshevism, a hatred of the Bolshevik regime in Russia, and talk of social solidarity, that's the old leftist uh, agenda, and corporatism, semi-fascist set of ideas, 
um, to reliance upon Catholic tradition and willingness to use arbitrary executive powers. What was thought by the late 1930s is this wasn't enough to hold um, any adherence of Sanatia together, and therefore his successors began stressing increasingly ethnic and even racist messages. Um, they insisted upon the importance of ethnic Polish control of politics, culture, and the economy, and began themselves taking on elements of national democratic language. In 1937, Piłsudski's successors created their own mass organization, which was supposed to be like a fascist organization, uh, but not fascist. It was supposed to act like a lightning rod for fascist sentiments, but not be fascist. It was called the Camp of National Unification, or Ozone, um, and it emphasized so-called ethnic self-defense. In May of 1938, Ozone passed resolutions making the Jewish question the prime concern of public policy and calling the country's three and a half million Jews an alien group that weakened the Polish state and must leave. The somewhat more moderate Polish foreign minister you may have heard of, Józef Beck, I'll be saying more about him, said uh, in 1937 that Poland had room for only a half million Jews. Here, he in some senses, was agreeing with Domowski. Therefore, the other three million had to leave. Didn't say exactly where. People in those days uh, in the center and right talked a lot about Madagascar as a place that Jews could and should be deported to. In the mid to late 1930s, um, at least um, several dozen Jews died. The exact number is unknown, and over 2,000 were injured in increasingly frequent anti-Semitic disturbances that broke out across Poland. In addition, both the government and the Catholic Church supported boycotts of Jewish businesses that were organized by the radical right. The leader of the Polish Catholic Church, uh, Cardinal August Hlond, spoke of the need for what he said, Polish ethnic self-love. It was right to love one's, name, one's own nation more than others. Uh, and the need to defend against Jews, Jews as supposed enemies of Christianity. He said that Jews practice white slavery. But he said in the, in the same paragraph, I believe, of a, of a sermon in 1936, that violence against them was wrong. That one should defend oneself against Jews and boycott them, but not attack them physically. That was the distinction he drew. Um, discrimination at universities never became law in Poland, unlike Hungary. Uh, but collusion of professors on university entrance boards, in Poland there are, there are um, oral examinations to get into universities. So what, and, and I actually spoke to an elderly man um, in Krakow in the late 1980s named David Erstein, who had tried to go to medical school in 1920 in his home city of Lwów. And in this oral examination, he was simply asked questions by the professors, having heard his name, that were impossible to answer. So he, of course, failed. And you'll never guess where he went to, to, to complete medical school. He went to Berlin. And then he went to the German University in Prague, because he couldn't be educated in Poland. Uh, through th through th such, such measures as that, although discrimination was not law, uh, the numbers of Jews in Polish universities drew, I'm sorry, dropped from over 20% in the mid-1920s to about 10% in 1939. Nationalist students harassed their Jewish classmates, forcing them to sit in designated areas of lecture halls, so-called ghetto benches, and attacking Jews outside the classroom, throwing stones at them, for example, and subjecting them to beatings. Jews who graduated were mostly refused entry into the state administration, although they were inducted to, into and loyally served in the military. The government um, did some interesting things in the economy after Pilsudski's death. It helped, um, it built, uh, for example, a, a major railway link between Silesia and the north, uh, in fact, it built a harbor city near uh, Gdynia, I'm sorry, near uh, Gdansk, Danzig, in, in, in what was a fishing village called Gdynia. It developed the oil industry. Nevertheless, unemployment remained a problem, um, and labor relations were very difficult in the late 1930s. Employers reduced pay and violated agreements that had been reached by collective bargaining uh, with impunity. The result was over 2,000 strikes in the year 1936 alone involving 675,000 workers. At times, strikers were able to realize their demands, but more often, the police crushed the protest and workers lost jobs. A wave of factory, I'm just giving you a sense of how active the Polish working class was in these years. A uh, wave of factory occupation strikes consumed the city of Krakow in the spring of 1936. On March 23rd, police fired upon demonstrators who had taken to the streets after reports that police had beaten women strikers. A procession for eight workers who were killed that day 
brought tens of thousands, again, under these conditions of a dictatorial regime, tens of thousands to a procession at the Rakovetsky Cemetery that mixed working class and Catholic symbolism. There were large silver, silver crosses painted, painted upon black coffins while workers carried burning torches and banners of the Polish Marxist Socialist Party. The protest resumed, and by May, 59 factories were again striking in Kraków. Now, you know Poland is a mostly peasant country, and what is remarkable about the late 1930s is that this unrest spread to the countryside, where the population is difficult to organize. It was widely dispersed, often illiterate, uh, yet the sense of desperation caused mobilization to carry over into the peasantry. It's estimated that in the 1930s, some four million peasants lived on the land whom the land could not support. Too many mouths to feed. The technical term for this population is surplus population. Um, it's a very cruel term, but it gives you some sense of what the reality was like. The government had little program other than to stay in power as far as the peasants were concerned. In June 1936, the Inspector General of the Army, whose picture I've shown you, Edvard Schmigli Ridge, decided he would use a commemoration at the Battle of Novoselets. It occurred in 1634. Poles have a very long historical memory. This was a battle at which peasants had held off the Tatars with clubs and scythes. Um, and he wanted to manipulate, use this event in order to show the unity of the people with its army leader. Uh, but the peasants decided themselves that they would use the general's visit to manifest their desire for a return to democracy. Um, the general was cordially greeted when he arrived at their village with bread and salt, but then he met unpleasant surprises. <coughs> During breakfast, a peasant leader declared, peasants have given their blood for Poland and will do so in the future, but we must be given back the rights that have been taken from us in the last 10 years. People had a very vivid uh, sense of their rights of self-rule dating to deeply back in history. Um, another positive thing to say about, this late, about the mobilization of the late 1930s is that uh, increasing repression at the hands of the police brought peasant politicians from the Russian and Austrian sections together as never before, but it also united various factions in the democratic center, Polish socialists, members of the peasant, peasant parties, but also the Jewish socialists of the Bund came together in joint tickets in several Polish cities. Uh, in 1938, there were communal elections, so municipal and regional elections, and the Jewish Bund and the Polish Socialist Party together won, won majorities in cities across Poland, including three of the largest, Warsaw, Krakow, and Łódź. Interestingly, it's a bit like elections recently in Poland where the cities tended to elect people on the left, whereas the countryside lends, uh, tends, to, tends to elect the governing PIS party. Um, however, the nationalists uh, retained their control of central government. They didn't weaken. And if Domovsky hadn't suffered a stroke in 1937, they might have seized power. Uh, little change at the very top. Sonatia remained a heterogeneous bloc with real, little real character or policy. And if one wing of the movement went too far to, the, to one side, the other forced it to a retreat. Um, there was talk within Sanazi of electoral ref reform, but in early 1939, the sudden looming threat of Nazi Germany overshadowed everything else. At that point, and from that point, the only talk in polit politics uh, was of national unity. In January 1939, the Polish Peasant Party, which had otherwise been a critic of Sanazi, declared its support for the unification of society around the defense of the state. Unity became a catchword across the political spectrum, especially after Poland rejected Germany's demands for alliance and territory in the spring. Hitler had assumed, um, after he took care of Czechoslovakia and Austria in 1938, that Poland would become his ally. This is a, this is a story that actually is not very well understood, I think, uh, in the West. He assumed that given the anti-communism and anti-Semitism in Poland, that Poland would be a natural ally in the campaign that he was planning. He already described it in Mein, mein Kampf for um, a Nazi crusade against the USSR for Lebensraum. Um, in a meeting that he, he had with Foreign Minister Josef Beck in Berlin in January of 1939, Hitler demanded that Poland join the anti-Comintern pact. This was an anti-Bolshevik alliance that included J Japan and Italy. And then he made two further demands that he considered to be generous. Poland should agree to Germany's control of the city of Danzig, 
known in Polish as Gdańsk, a mostly ethnic German city that since 1920 had been a free state under the League of Nations. Uh, and in fact, not something that Poland could have given Hitler even if Poland had wanted to do so. His other demand, which seems actually quite mild in retrospect, is that Poland should agree to the construction of an extraterritorial highway that would connect the main body of Germany to East Prussia, which was divided by territory uh, that actually Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, promised to Poland in 1918 uh, um, in his 14 point speech. Um, all that Germany, all that Germany was asking is, is not that Poland cede that territory, the po so-called Polish Carter, but permit the construction of a rail line and, and a highway. Um, Poland said no to these demands. Um, and then in the spring of 1939 incurred Hitler's wrath by securing a British guarantee of its sovereignty. I could talk more about British politics if, if there's interest, uh, but the basic point of the story is that Hitler had misjudged Poland. For the Polish establishment, national sovereignty, the regaining of sovereignty in 1918, had a value that outweighed all other considerations. There's an interesting video that I was watching last night on YouTube. Um, Josef Beck, the foreign minister, got up in front of the Polish parliament and said that Poland, like all states, values peace, but peace is a relative value. More important than peace is honor. That is why Poland had to say no to, to, to Nazi Germany. Um, an alliance with Germany would have reduced Poland to vassal status, which would have been an intolerable humiliation, especially on the background of the struggles for Polish independence in the 19th century. As soon as Hitler learned of Britain's pledge to do everything possible to protect Poland in late March of 1939, Britain had given no pledge before that point, he began, that he began planning the, the destruction of Poland, vowing, as he said, to concoct a devil's brew. Therefore, and this is the thing that I think that most of you may not be aware of, uh, the German attack that you know about, the beginning of World War I in the fall of 1939, came not as a result of a long-term plan of the Nazi regime to subjugate Poland. The Nazi regime wanted Poland as an ally, but as, as the result of a decision by Poland's government, widely supported by its citizenry from right to left, to say no to Hitler. Uh, but the violence that was then unleashed 4.30 in the morning on September 1st, 1939, was unprecedented in European history. But that is a um, subject of a different lecture. So now I'm going to wrap things up. Um, before I do, I'm going to show you a few images without much commentary and, 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 and play a brief segment of um, an interview with a, a, a Jewish woman who studied in Warsaw in the 1930s. Oh, and by the way, this is, this, is a, this is the gate of Warsaw University in the 1930s demanding that Jews sit in so-called ghettos. But I want to show you a few pictures of uh, Jewish life in the 1930s without commentary, and we can talk about it later on. Just for your information, uh, the young man on the right is Mordechai Anjelovich. You may know from his wartime career, but here he is enjoying time in uh, the Zionist youth movement in the late 1930s. Here's a portrait of Mina Natal and Benno Schmelke during their engagement party in Jeshuv in 1939. I have these images, um, actually thanks to a friend of mine in the audience as well, but from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, in case you're interested. Here's a picture of the Littmann family out for a boat ride in 1933 in Poland. Here's a picture of the Berkovich family eating in an outdoor cafe with friends and relatives while on vacation in the resort town of Krynica in 1937. Several generations, and note the couples dancing in the background. I'd love to know what the music was. Uh, here is, I can't read the first, let me see if I can see. Uh, Isaac and Tola. Goldblum posing with their daughter Solusha in the doorway of their kosher butcher shop in Katowice in 1936. Can you, you all more or less make out the faces. And this is the last one I'll show you um, of Jewish life in Poland in the 1930s. This is from 1937 from Wuj. It's the Mienzi, Zetsky, and Herzkowitz families at the train station in Wuj where they bade farewell, farewell to relatives who were returning to France after a family visit, 1937.
Okay, now I would like to show you a snippet of an interview. Let's see if I can get this up. Universities permitted a ghetto bench policy initiated by student groups requiring Jews to sit apart. National Democratic and fascist students incited violence against Jews. If they could attend classes at all, most Jewish students stood in protest. I had a friend, Vanda, by the name of Vanda, who was not Jewish. So we went to university and we both stood. Uh, in the back of the auditorium and when the class was over a group of students came they were all men and uh, they said why are you standing here so I said I'm standing because I'm Jewish and Wanda said I'm standing because I'm Polish and that enraged them I think that they were more enraged by Wanda than by me they expected me to stand but so they beat us up. There were six or seven of them. And they sort of started hitting us. It was a horrible feeling because there was nobody who would come to our rescue. I didn't believe that antisemitism was somehow native to Poland. I thought it is a political issue, economical issue. And that uh, once we have different set of politics, well, there will be no antisemitism. The Polish government proposed a ban on ritual slaughter for kosher meat. The Jewish community... Okay, does anybody recognize that voice, by the way? Anybody watch news in the 1960s? Roger Mudd. Yeah. So this is, this is a fabulous... Um, it's a nine-part series in Polish history called Struggles for Poland, made in the 1980s. Highly recommend it. You can easily get this... Uh, uh, it's not all available on YouTube, but much of it, it's available very cheaply um, in DVD. Anyway, I can, I can say more about that if there's interest. So some concluding words. Uh, the story we, we just heard of these two friends um, in studying law in Warsaw in the 1930s. What do we make of this story? Or what do we make of the images that I've just shown you? These, in some senses, um, fascinating glimpses of life in the 1930s. What do we make of them? Was Poland in the interwar years good or bad for Jews and, and the other minorities? The historian Omer Bartov spoke in this room a few months ago on his book, his recently published book, about the town where his family came from in eastern Poland. And he spoke about his mother, who, like many young Jews, was desperate to get out. Uh, miraculously, she succeeded just before restrictions for emigration to Palestine worsened. I think it was 1935 that she got out. She and her family were desperate because of the hostility uh, on the part of Polish neighbors, because of high unemployment, because of what seemed dwindling chances, because many, indeed perhaps most Poles, thought Jews did not belong. They were not part of the Polish nation, the Polish Narut. Uh, and this, as we've seen, included some top representatives of state after Piłsudski's death. Still, in that time, most Jews, I think it is safe to say, most Polish Jews lived lives of dignity in the Poland of that time, with all the pains and pleasures that most people experience in their quotidian lives. There was a tremendous diversity of Jewish cultural and political life in Poland in the interwar years, supported by a fantastic array of organizations, Zionist, Bundist, Orthodox. There were reading rooms and cafeterias, sanatoria, leisure and sporting associations, Fantastic array of publications. The city of Warsaw alone, the city of Warsaw alone had five Yiddish dailies. Was Poland therefore good for the Jews? The answer, I think, is it was good as well as bad. And if it was good, that had usually probably mostly little to do with the desires or plans of those in power. The Polish Constitution of 1921, whose preamble I showed you earlier, like all constitutions, that were passed in the, in the new Eastern Europe after World War I guaranteed
basic civil liberties like freedoms of association, the inviolability of person and property, freedom to practice one's culture and religion, and the state, even under Pilsudski after 1926, mostly respected those rights, with some exceptions uh, such as I've mentioned. Therefore, within the framework of a state that mostly respected the rule of law, Jews themselves, like other Polish citizens, could seek to make their own fates and pursue their own fortunes within the constraints and possibilities of the capitalist order of that time. Therefore, if Poland was, in some sense, good for Jews, if it was good for Jews at all, that was because of what Jews themselves could do for themselves and what Jews themselves actually did. Occasionally, I might add, in a, an ecumenical spirit, in cooperation with Poles and other, um, with Polish friends and associates. So with that, I will conclude my remarks and um, await any thoughts or questions you have. Okay, maybe uh, there's a hand on the left. I, I hear you, but uh, testing one two three. Testing one two three. Okay, um, I, uh, you mentioned initially there were mostly um, uh, Protestants in um, Poland. That was the, the major religion. No, no Catholics. Cat Pilsudski was okay. Protestant. That's so, the unusual thing. So. My question is, was the church the main source of anti-Semitism in Poland during the interwar years? Well, I would say that the, the church is the deepest source of anti-Semitism because of, of the old ideas uh, that we sometimes refer to as anti-Judaism, the idea that uh, Jews were Christ killers. This is something that comes out of Christianity. But I would also say that this new movement that I mentioned, national democracy, was intensely anti-Catholic. So that ca it cannot be regarded as the most important source of, of racist anti-Semitism. Um, so it's, it's, it's a complicated answer. What, what happened in, uh, before World War I is that Domofsky expressed his hostility to the church, and other nationalists in Eastern Europe did the same, as, as, as an old-style institution, an old-guard institution that believed that Jews could become Christians through baptism and the like. He thought that was unacceptable. But after World War I, he recognized the value of, he claimed to recognize the value of, of Catholicism for uh, the Polish state and nation. He was also recognizing the fact that a lot of priests were very enthusiastic about national democratic ideas. So I, my, my answer would be that um, um, there's a very tight relation between um, Polish Catholicism and anti-Semitism, but they are not the, the exact same thing. There were other kinds of um, trends and currents entering uh, modern thought that fed anti-Semitism that were not Christian. Uh, but by the 1930s, and I've done a lot of reading on this myself, if you looked at uh, even relatively centrist Polish Catholic publications, you won't find any voices from a Christian perspective opposing anti-Semitism. So in that sense, one, one can say that Catholicism, Catholicism did not oppose anti-Semitism. Um, but that's, anyway, there, there were during, if we talked about the wartime, this would be a much longer discussion. There were, uh, during the war, there were certain, uh, interestingly enough, anti-Semites, Christian anti-Semites whose conscience, conscience was awakened by the brutality of the Nazis who got involved in rescue oper operations like Irena Sendlerova, for example. Anyway, it's a long answer. We could um, correspond if you have further interest in the subject. Yeah, my question is actually two. Um, one is, uh, if did Poland exist at all during World War I? Because I thought the Polish army had fought, and there was this tradition of the Polish army. Yeah, there was, um, well, there was a relatively autonomous part of Poland in the south called Galicia. It was not technically Poland, but when Germany conquered, um, Russian held Poland in 1915, it set up a Polish kingdom. So it set up a sort of a Polish vassal state but it was not an independent Polish state. 
It did, however, permit the flourishing of Polish culture. So, for example, the language of instruction at the University of Warsaw switched from Russian to Polish in 1915. Uh, but all three occupying powers enlisted Polish soldiers in their causes. So, you know, in, in, in Poles um, who lived in the German occupying power put on a German uniform and heard you know, German um, um, discipline and German commands and the like and served the German state. There was no Polish state in World War I, properly speaking. Um, and then the, uh, the other question I had is, um, I read uh, the biography of um, Janusz Korczak and, um, and then some of his books um, that have been in English and wondered, and, and that's where I thought there was because he had been in the Polish army. Well, there was a Polish army that emerged after World War I, very, very quickly. There, that's, that's what Piłsudski then took elements of Polish units that were fighting for the three powers and Polish units that were fighting in the West. There were actually Polish units that were fighting in France and, 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 and forged them into an army. That was the Polish army. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk, I really enjoyed it. And I wondered if you could say a few words about what in um, Zionist history is considered as the, the third Aliyah, or the third immigration, which is supposed to be Polish and supposed to be connected to Grapsi, Grapski, who was a um, National Democrat, I think. Do you mean the, min the Minister of Finance, yeah. Władysław yeah. Grapski? What, what is the, the, the third what? The third Aliyah, the third immigration. Emigration? First, second, third, whatever. No, Palestine, I, yeah. I should have said one thing I am not is a history of Polish, uh, a historian of Polish Jew Jewry. I just, I don't know. Sorry. I can, I can say, however, that the, the, the National Democrats in an odd way um, fostered um, ideas of Polish emigration for their own purposes, if that's what you're uh, getting at. A quick question. Can you tell us where to find the, the name of the video series and where it's available? Yeah, I would, uh, it's called Struggles for Poland. Uh, the narrator is Roger Mudd. It's incredibly balanced, I, I think. It's based upon a um, history written by Neil Asherson, who's a British journalist. Um, so you can also get a book, but the, but the series, I would simply go into Google and type in, um, I hate to, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna advertise actually any, any particular place to get it. If you go to Google, type in Struggles for Poland, you can get, it's a three DVD set, uh, nine episodes, and my colleague David Frick, who teaches Polish history at the university also uses it, it's very good. Struggles for Poland. It might be available in a library perhaps? It is, it's available in Moffat, it used to be. It used to be, do you remember uh, those video cassettes that used to exist? It's available in those in Moffat Library. Great, thank you. Thanks for a great talk. You, uh, you mentioned briefly the peasant society and you said a little bit at the beginning about some class issues. But I'm curious, in the 20s, before the Depression, how would you characterize the state functions that were centralized compared to being distributed amongst cities or towns or smaller county measures that did, did most polls or residents of Poland, at least, in the 20s, care that much about what was going on in national politics, or was national politics more like a sport yeah, for a small class of elites? Well, that's, that's why Pilsudski was able to seize power with, with a lot of popular support, because the, if you had read the newspapers in 1925 and 26, uh, journalists uh, representing popular opinion were fed up with the, the corruption and, and, and the um, the, the, the gesturing and the, you know, the emp empty um, the shenanigans taking place in the, in the parliament in, in Warsaw, the, the inability of the government to come together in a unified way and have a coherent po set of policies. So what people got, got of the government was, was mostly the administrators coming in and building schools. A lot of schools were built, for example, uh, and there, were, there was progress also in unifying uh, Poland's infrastructure, which had been divided in three. The problem in the Russian section was, is that the, the railroad gauge was much wider than in the other sections. So all of that had to be changed, and the state actually oversaw it in the 1920s, made tremendous progress in unifying Poland in that sense. So you're, so you're right, so that on the one hand, there's, there's sort of this administrative core that's central state bureaucrats who go out and build schools and uh, extend the higher education network. 
uh, make sure that certain standards are observed in, in, in the sales of produce and things like that. Uh, on the other hand is, is this theater in, in, in Warsaw that people had grown tired of. And Pilsudski in particular was very concerned in 1925 that Germany had come together with its former Western opponents with France and Britain and formed an agreement in the Italian city of Locarno um, that guaranteed the Western borders of Germany but not the Eastern borders and open by Weimar Germany. So democratic Germany was basically saying, we want to try to change those borders. Ger Germany wanted the, the area of Upper Silesia, desperately wanted that back. It had been German territory. It was Poland's major industry. That's why it got it after World War I. So the Pilsudski's concern was that this bickering in parliament is, is going to make Poland unable to defend its basic sovereignty. That's, that's the, the most direct reason why he moved in, I would say. But he, became, he, he was a disillusioned I could talk at greater length about Pilsudski. He was a disillusioned politician by that point. He had, he had very little faith in, in democracy, although he claimed to be a Democrat himself. Um, so that's what, I, that's what I would say. So basically, um, it was precisely the impression that you, that you mentioned that permitted Pilsudski to very uh, smoothly advance to power in 1926. I wanted to thank you for uh, an extraordinarily um, clear and, and, and concise summary of, uh, of the period. You covered an enormous amount of ground. I know you can't uh, go into all the details, but you ended with a question. Was this period good for the Jewish community or not? And uh, I wish you had spent a few more minutes on uh, some of the details of just what that Jewish community, I, I realize you were talking about Poland as a whole, right. but I wish you'd spent a few more minutes on what that Jewish community accomplished in terms of uh, the establishment of, of separate Jewish schools, uh, Jewish self-defense forces, you mentioned Jewish newspapers, uh, Jewish political parties, uh, the, the, their success in the local elections, which you refer to, um, uh, in, in, in Warsaw, uh, Lodz and, and Krakow, uh, even though they never succeeded on the national level. And uh, had there not been the Holocaust, I, I think that the, the legacy of that Jewish society would have been one of the treasures of, of contemporary Judaism. We lost an enormous amount there. And uh, so, so for me, the, the, the tragedy is the Holocaust. And to answer the question you closed with, was it a good thing? I think it was a wonderful thing. And uh, what, what, what was a wonderful thing? Uh, the, the, um, the richness yes. and, and uh, success of the Jewish community within interwar Poland. The Volkszeitung was the organ of the Bund. You have that up on your screen right now. And by the way, I don't know if you, you, you realized it, but you had a wonderful little quote there from Isa Ehrlich. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know, but she was the daughter-in-law of Viktor Ehrlich, uh -huh. uh, who was the head of the Polish Bund. Um, and there's a, there's a real continuity of tradition that's really worth looking into there. Anyhow, thank you very yeah, much I for just, a wonderful talk. I think I, I wanted to underline the, the fact that it's, uh, it's a, a very tricky issue to talk about um, Jewish life in interwar Poland because on the one hand, there's this tremendous tendency to see everything moving toward World War II and the Holocaust and everything in the shadow of that that precedes it. You can't help, help feeling, you, I was watching a video of, of, of children at a Zionist um, camp singing Wir kommen an, uh, and how does in, in, in Yiddish. It was a beautiful song that they were singing, and you, you, you can't help feeling sad thinking that a few years later, the kind of reality that these children then would have to experience. So, and, and, and as Omar Bartov noted, there, there was a, an agreement across much of ethnic Polish society that Jews simply didn't belong, right? So, so the basics, and, and the government itself, as, 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 as I've shown, was, uh, was dedicated to the proposition that Jews should should leave, right? So and there's that reality. But then there's this extreme, you know, this extremely rich uh, cultural and political life, uh, intellectual life. The fact that even you know, in the Polish language, the greatest poet was Jewish, Julian Tuvim, right? I mean, one could go on and on at very great length. Uh, Alexander Vat. There was there was there was a whole literary subculture that was Jewish that's been described very well by 
professor at Yale named Marcy, Mar Marcy Schur, right? So, so the, the trick, I think, when talking about interwar Poland is somehow to bring these two perspectives together. That's why it's what I tried to do at, 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 the, at the very end uh, without simplifying. Um, interesting thing is when Omar Bartov spoke, I don't know if Professor uh, Hagen is not here tonight so I can speak in his absence. So Professor William Hagen from Davis wrote an article that was very influential about 20 years ago basically treating those years before the war as a prelude to the Holocaust because things were getting so bad for Poland's Jews economically uh, in those years and the, and the state harassment was intensifying, right? And he looked at the Sanatia group and the National Democratic group, couldn't see a positive politician anywhere. Yet when he was in the audience a couple of months ago when Omar Bartov was speaking, he tried to actually push Professor Bartov to admit that there, was, that there, was, uh, there were in fact elements, segments of Polish society, ethnic Polish, you know, Christian society, that were in favor of some kind of recognition of, Jew, of Jews as, as fellow Poles. So, so within Polish society itself, it would be a great subject for research to find out, you know, who was her friend? That's one of the questions I had about this video was, who was Wanda? Who was this woman? Where did she come from? Where did she get her idea that she would stand with her friend? Was it a purely personal thing? Was it partly political? Was it, was it, had any, did it have anything to do with her identity as a Pole? Was it broader than just her? You know, all these questions that follow from that, that's why I, I wanted to show that. I don't think historians have given a good answer to that question. So I guess my, my <laughs> thanking you for your question, I would, I would, I would say what, what I'm trying to suggest is that there's, there's, there's room for a lot more research on precisely those, those, those issues. I love your maps, Professor Conley. I just love those nice bright colors and so on. Um, you mentioned two, two constitutions. One constitution in 1791, yes. right after the American Constitution, the second constitution in 1921. You showed us a preamble and the word narod, which of course is people. Uh, question of the definition of Poland. Um, the bright colors on your maps show us very clearly the different linguistic differences inside Poland. For example, Polish, Ukrainian, Belarus, and, and uh, Lithuanian. Um, the question I have is uh, religious identity. In other words, was Poland irrevocably connected with the Roman Catholic religion or not? There was, was what connected to Poland? Whether Poland was irrevocably uh, defined by Roman Catholicism. There are four religions in Poland in the interwar period. There's the Jewish religion, there's the Lutheran religion, uh, there's the um, Roman Catholic, and then there's the fourth religion, which is almost never spoken of, which is the Uniate. And of course, the Uniates and the Roman Catholics have in common, they both have loyalty to the Pope. And I always think of the Uniate as part of the, um, the period before the Polish partition, when Poland was extending into Ukraine. And so they, uh, they accepted the, the Orthodox rituals, but they changed the, um, the allegiance to Rome in order. So in other words, is, is, is Poland and Roman Catholicism interconnected in such a way that you could deny that Jews could be citizens, you could deny that uh, maybe, you said that Pilsudski converted uh, at the yeah, end. No, I, think, I, I would, well, who gets to determine who's really Polish? I mean, that's, I don't know. I mean, fortunately, there is no, no such uh, instance that, 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 that could do that. But what I wanted to indicate was that the, the Poland that Pilsudski felt part of was not Catholic. But, but, you know, I was just reading a, a report of a very sad event that took place in Paris a couple of days ago, which a very distinguished uh, historian of the Holocaust, Leo Chuck, from Warsaw was speaking. And there was this team of Polish Catholics who sort of showed up at this event in which he was speaking basically in a, in a scholarly way about the war and about, the, you know, the, the problems of relations between Jews and Poles during the war. And this, this supposedly Catholic you know, Polish group got up there and did all they could to keep him from speaking and disturbed his presentation. Is that Polish? Is that Catholic? You know, in my view, it's not. Uh, my Pol the Polish friends that, that I have, and I assume some of you have as well, are people who, who also look back to a, a rich heritage of Christianity, of secularism, of socialism, of Judaism, of Lithuanian and, and, and Ukrainian and German and, um, and, and linguistically Polish heritage as, as all somehow having a place. Unfortunately, the current government of Poland doesn't seem to see, see things that way. Okay, but, I would, I, but so my answer would be that historically speaking, it is, it is, is incorrect to say that, that Poland is irrevocably Catholic. The Catholic uh, hierarchy, um, in fact, was, in, was, was hostile to Polish nationalism all the way to, oh, let's see how, to the 1930s, really. 
and the episcopate as well, uh, was loyal to the partitioning powers. That was the Catholic position. At the same time, there's, there's, a, there's a folk religiosity in the villages that is very important for people's sense of identity. Okay, so it's a comp I can't give you a definitive answer, but my, my basic answer would be no. Poland is not irrevocably Catholic. I say that as a Catholic. <laughs>